without any further banter from me, I present to you Seamus DeMarais. You guys hear okay everywhere? Yeah, excellent. All right, uh, before we get started, how about a big hand for Mike Valine, our announcer? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right, uh, thanks so much for joining me this morning uh, for my presentation, Power Up, the Multifaceted Benefits and Capabilities of Nagios. I gotta be honest, I did not expect this many people to be here for this. Um, but I'm thankful that you're all here. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, hopefully you'll find it informative and a little bit entertaining. Um, my name's Seamus Demeray. I'm a sales tech at Nagios Enterprises. Um, don't let the tech part fool you though. I've learned a lot since I started at Nagios in 2011, but I know about 10% as much as almost every single person I work with. Um, that being said, this is gonna be a fairly high level presentation. Um, we're not gonna see a lot of code snippets or deep dives into anything in particular. Uh, we will see a lot of screenshots, a lot of broad generalizations, video game references, hopefully a little bit of fun, but uh, we will get an inside look at the various capabilities of Nagios and the various types of Nagios that are available. Um, so now that you know that, we'll get started. Uh, let's talk about Nagios. What is Nagios? Uh, well, it's a, a comprehensive monitoring, alerting, graphing, and reporting solution. Um, and by monitoring and alerting, I mean you can monitor IT infrastructure elements for their health and be alerted when things break, which most of the people here probably know, but we'll kind of start from scratch. Um, Nagios is awesome. In my opinion, it's an awesome solution. Um, it's an awesome community of people that revolve around Nagios and contribute to it. And it's also an awesome company uh, to work for, to be a part of. I mean, it's, it's great going to work every day and working with all these cool people. Uh, so there's a lot of awesome around Nagios. And uh, it's very flexible. Um, there is an active, thriving global community. There's people all over the world um, using Nagios. There's millions of users all over the world. Um, Part of that is due to the fact that it's an awesome solution with great built-in capabilities. And it's, you know, it's been around for a long time, since 1999. So the longevity of the project is very high. And as a result of that, there's people all over the place using it, um, leveraging the power of Nagios to monitor their, their IT infrastructures. Um, it's very powerful. One of the great things about Nagios is that you can monitor just about anything. Um, there's a set of built-in plugins, the Nagios Plugins Project, uh, but there's also thousands of plugins on the Nagios Exchange that you can use to monitor just about anything. So it's, it's basically, we, we always say that with Nagios you can monitor just about anything that uses electricity. Uh, and that's true, whether it's servers, switches, routers, websites, you name it. Um, even into like synthetic transactions on a website, duplicating uh, user behavior and making sure that various things are working. Nagios can do that. Um, we offer three different types of Nagios. Um, there's Core Do-It-Yourself, that's, uh, that's the open source version that's freely available on nagios.org. There's the uh, student and professional virtual machines, which are a great way to get started right out of the box with a really cool virtual machine preloaded with, with a bunch of great Nagios products and projects. And then there's Nagios XI, the enterprise class commercial monitoring solution, which has a ton of power out of the box. Um, and it's also very user friendly. Uh, it's easy to use for people who might not be quite as familiar with Nagios. So, now that we've talked a little bit about Nagios, the industry standard in IT infrastructure monitoring, let's talk about Nagios Core Do-It-Yourself. Uh, Nagios Core Do-It-Yourself, uh, this is open source GPL version two. So it's an open source license, it's a monitoring and alerting engine. Um, you can install it on just about any popular Linux build, which is a big strength, uh, you know, regardless of what type of Linux you prefer to use, you can install Nagios Core on it. Um, it's configured with flat text files on the command line. Um, which I don't want to say is a downside because some people prefer that. I mean, some people really like configuring on the command line and have a lot of ways to do that quickly. Um, it does have a basic optional built-in web display, um, but the configuration on the command line means uh, you need to know a little bit about Linux. You need to know how to open a text file, um, how to make changes to it, save those changes, and you also need to understand how to configure things like host and service and command definitions inside of Nagios. So there's a little bit of a learning curve. You do have to have some Linux knowledge and some Nagios knowledge to really leverage it and start monitoring things. But uh, once you have that, there's a lot of power. And uh, there's thousands of projects on the Nagios Exchange community site that you can use to extend core. Uh, and that's Nagios, uh, exchange.nagios.org. And I took a screenshot recently just to give you an idea of the, the scope of what's available here. And down on the bottom, you can see there's over 4,000 projects submitted by the community. Um, so tons of projects, tons of ways to extend Nagios. And over 3,000 of those are plugins. 
and plugins are what you would run against various types of devices to return results and figure out what the status of that device is so that Nagios could then alert you. Uh, lots of other stuff on the exchange. Um, you know, there's plenty of documentation, um, various tutorials, translations. Um, so lots to see and do on the exchange, and it's all completely free. Uh, it's really cool because if people have a less common type of device that they need to figure out a way to monitor with Nagios, they'll develop a plugin to do this and then ideally bring it back to the community so that everybody can leverage that work and take advantage of the, the things that they learn and the things that they accomplish to monitor it. So uh, really, really cool place to go. I'd highly recommend checking out the Nagios Exchange for anybody who's interested in Nagios. Um, now I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, on the Nintendo network, you can download just about any classic Nintendo game for about $5, which is great, but it also results in a whole lot of classic Nintendo game playing. Um, I thought one cool way to compare the various offerings of Nagios would be in terms of uh, Mario power-ups. So if you're not familiar with Super Mario, just in case, um, it's these little Italian plumbers that run around these crazy worlds collecting coins and mushrooms and flowers to power up and trying to rescue a princess. Well, there's three different Ma uh, Mario power-up levels. There's Little Mario, and then there's uh, Super Mario. When he gets a mushroom, he grows and he has other abilities. And then there's Fire Mario, who we'll talk about later, who's awesome. So <laughs> uh, Nagios Core Do It Yourself would basically be Little Mario. Um, and the cool thing about Little Mario, he's fast, he's small, you know, reliable, maneuverable. Little Mario can jump just as far as Big Mario, right? He's got, he's got the same capabilities. If, he knows, if you know how to use Mario, you can pick up shells and break bricks and accomplish all sorts of things beyond the basic capabilities of Mario. Um, just like Core can monitor across networks just as well as extended options, whether they're accessible or whether you have to use a passive model and send results back. Um, you can monitor just about anything the same way that little Mario can beat any level if you're an experienced Mario player, if, if you know how to, how to work the various things built into the level. Um, within Core, there's some state history reports. Um, so you can look at the, the state of the devices, the hosts that you're monitoring and their various services. And uh, it is, it's very powerful for experienced users, but it can be challenging for people who are new to Nagios or who don't have a lot of Linux experience. Um, it's also very extendable, which we talked about in brief and we'll go into a little bit more. And so, uh, so yeah, Nagios Core Do-It-Yourself would basically be like little Mario, super capable, but you have to be experienced. Or at least take the time to learn. Um, so here's a look at the Nagios Core web display. And uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to see useful information in the core web display, but there's really not a lot of ways to interact with the core engine, manager configurations, stuff like that. So looking here at the home page, uh, useful information right out of the gate, we can see that there's a new version of Nagios Core, um, and this is a little bit old, uh, so there's Core 4 now, and there's a ton of ways to learn about that here at the conference. Um, we can see tactical overviews, uh, we can look at network maps, we can look at the various hosts and services that we have configured, uh, as well as our host and service groups, which are a way to logically organize similar devices, like if you had a bunch of Linux servers, you could make a Linux server host group and very quickly look at the status of all of those like devices. Um, and so you can see summary and grid views of those. There's also some basic reports built in, uh, availability, trends, so on and so forth, and we'll take a closer look at those in a second. Um, but as far as some of the specific things that you can see inside the core web display, we've got our tactical overview. And this gives us a lot of useful information uh, right away about the state of our uh, various hosts and services. And you can see here we've got uh, network outages. In this case, we have none. That's great. We don't have any hosts down, unreachable. All of them are up. Um, we do have a couple of critical services. So looking at the tactical overview is a great way to very quickly see, hey, what's wrong with my network? And typically, the feedback that we get from administrators is they're not so concerned about what's right. You know, if it's working, great. Let it keep working. Um, but they want to know what's broken. And so the tactical overview is a quick way to see that. Um, so you could click through. If you were to click here on Too Critical, you'd click through and see more details about those particular services that are having problems. And then we've got some uh, monitoring performance information on the upper right, and just a kind of a summary of overall host and service health percentage. The network map is a really cool thing that's built right into Core. Um, it uh, leverages the parent-child relationships you define to create a network topography view. So you can actually see how all of the various hosts that you're monitoring are related to all of the other hosts on your network. And this is a really useful way to, uh, to basically see what impact one host going down could have on the rest of the network. And uh, it's also a cool bit of logic in Nagios where if a parent device is down, the children of that device won't be alerted on as warning or critical 
they'll be alerted on as unreachable. So Nagios knows that it can't get to it, so it's not sending you alerts that there's like something wrong with it. It's just saying I can't reach this device until you've had a chance to resolve the issue with the, uh, with the parent host. Um, so that's really useful, and uh, the color of the uh, various circles would change uh, based on the status of the hosts. The service detail, and this would be if you were to go to your list of services and drill down to a specific service, uh, here you can actually see really detailed information about the specific service, which is a metric on a host that you're monitoring. Um, you can see the current status of that particular service, uh, status and performance data, um, it, information about the various checks happening, which types of checks are enabled and disabled, and there's also some basic ways to interact with the core engine here. Um, you can do things like disabling active checks for the service. Um, you can uh, uh, disable uh, event handlers, which are a simple example of an event handler would be when an, an alert happens, when a problem state occurs, Nagios is gonna send an alert. That's an event handler. The event was a warning or critical status, and the event was sending an alert to somebody. But that can be, uh, that can be extended where you can actually, uh, an example would be if you got an alert for hard drive capacity, you could automatically run disk cleanup on the machine that's uh, got an almost full hard drive. So event handlers, there's a lot you can do with those, but um, this would be the service detail. And then the reports that are built into Nagios Core, uh, you've got the availability report, which is uh, uptime of your hosts and services. Uh, like it says, really useful for, for determining service level agreement requirements and compliance. You've got trends, which gives you kind of a timeline breakdown of the states of particular hosts and services. Um, the alert history is just that. It's a tale of the tape of the historical alerts for your hosts and services. There's an alert summary report. Um, and that's useful because it basically tells you who the problem children are. It tells you which of your hosts and services are creating the most alerts. So, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You kind of want to go and take a look at those and say, hey, these are, this is alerting all the time. What's wrong here? Um, alert histogram. We'll take a look at the XI version of this in a little while, um, but basically it's a timeline where you can see the overall quantity of alerts happening on a timeline, which is also useful to say, hey, every day at noon we get a ton of alerts, there's a big spike, what's the problem with this particular time of day? Uh, and then notifications, just a tail of the tape of the notifications that went out from the system. Um, so that's a quick look at Core Do It Yourself. Like I said, there's a lot of depth, there's a lot of extensibility. Um, if, you, you know, if you take the time and learn, um, to leverage all of the various projects and everything that are available for core. Um, next up, we'll talk about the student and pro virtual machines. And these are uh, pre-installed VMware VMs uh, running CentOS 6 Linux. And they come pre-bundled with a lot of other add-ons and additional tools. So right out of the box, you can do a lot with Nagios. Um, and those are available as 32 uh, or 64-bit VMs. And it's strictly VMware, so it'd be a VMware Player, Workstation, uh, ESX, vSphere. So these would be a lot like Power Up Mario. So Super Mario, he got a mushroom, he's got a built-in brick breaker, for instance. So you know he can run around the level, he can smash bricks with his head instead of knowing how to use turtle shells to smash bricks. Um, so uh, for somebody just getting started, you, you can do more without having to know more. Um, it's got built-in graphs, the core config manager, NAGVIS, business process intelligence, uh, Nagios Mobile, Nagios SNMP trap interface, and Nagios B shell. And you might be saying, what are all these things and what good would they do me? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, so here's a comparison of the uh, core student and pro. And the uh, student version is on the upper left here. And you can see that that gives you Nagios. So it's Nagios pre-installed on CentOS Linux. So you can just spin up this VM, hit the web interface and start you know, looking at the things we just did, or go to the command line and start adding host and service and command configurations. Um, it's got graphs and it's got the core config manager um, in the uh, pro virtual machine, you've got Nagios, the graphs, the core config manager, as well as vShell, Nagios Mobile, the Nagios SNMP trap interface, NagViz, and Nagios BPI. Um, so a lot right out of the box with that, and the prices are really reasonable on the VMs. So the graphs are provided by PNP for Nagios, and you can learn more about that project at pnpfornagios.org. And here's just a screenshot of some of the graphs that are available. This would be CPU utilization for localhost. And so it's basically a way you're, you're collecting all of this data about how your hosts and services are performing, and these graphs are a way to uh, leverage that and look at it visually and say, well, you know, what does it look like over time, this particular utilization? And you can do things like exporting the graphs and so on with PNP. Uh, the Core Config Manager, to me, is one of the greatest things about the Core VMs, and this is in the student and the pro option. 
And this is a graphical configuration GUI uh, for Nagios Core. So you don't need to manage your hosts and services and so on on the command line. You can actually do it within this, uh, this web interface. Um, and you, uh, if you look at the submenu on the left here, um, you can modify your hosts and services, your host groups and, host and service groups, um, all of your templates, your contacts and contact groups, your uh, check commands, escalations, dependencies, all of that can be managed just by clicking around in the core config manager. Um, so it's a way for you, you, you still have to understand some of the logic involved and how these things work, but you don't have to, uh, you don't have to interact with them on the command line in text files. You can do it in this interface. Um, down on the bottom right, this isn't actually uh, what you normally see logging into the core config manager. This is a separate screenshot of host management within the CCM. And you can see there's a few tabs. We've got common settings, check settings, alert settings, and miscellaneous settings. So here we could modify things like parents, templates, host groups, uh, host name, various arguments and check commands, um, check intervals, thresholds. All of that can be modified within this GUI. Uh, which makes it much quicker and easier to do for, for a new user especially. Uh, vShell is a PHP web interface. Um, it's basically another way to visualize the core engine and the data that's coming from it. So uh, that's built in as well. And Nagios Mobile is really cool. Um, this is basically a mobile browser optimized look into core. So in this case, this is what you'd see on the left. This is what you'd be presented with when first logging in, and you can check this right from your mobile device. And you can see kind of a heads up view of what's going on. You know, we've got seven hosts that are up, 79 OK services, but we do have some critical services, some unhandled, uh, uh, some unhandled problems. Um, clicking through, we can see a list of all of the devices that are in a various state. And then clicking through again, we can get to a host and service detail, which is shown on the right here. So this is very useful for an admin on the go. It's built right in. You just go to the IP of your VM slash Nagios mobile, and you can see there's a lot of useful information here. You can also uh, do some basic interaction. Uh, you can do things like scheduling downtime, um, acknowledging alerts and removing acknowledgments, disabling and enabling notifications. Uh, and this is based on the Teeny Nagios project by Hirose Masaaki, and is, is really cool, a uh, really cool thing to have built into the core VMs. Nagios SNMP trap interface. I won't pretend to know a lot about SNMP traps, but in talking to uh, Nick Scott, who developed this, and other people who are, are much more well versed in SNMP and SNMP traps, I, I'm told that uh, without something like this interface, you'd be looking at a lot of logs um, to to do things like filter and search for and delete and archive SNMP results coming in. So with this, you get a PHP uh, front end for that for the MySQL and PostgreSQL backend that SNMP TT creates. Um, which uh, apparently is very, very useful. And uh, people that know more about SNMP traps would probably know more about how awesome it is, but I'm told that it's very cool. Uh, Nagviz is one of my favorites. This is a uh, data visualization tool, and you can learn more about this at nagviz.org. Uh, Nagviz is excellent. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to uh, create custom, uh, if you look on the right, like a Visio style diagram where you've got active icons on top of representations of your various network devices and connections. Um, you can also do things like the left, which is probably one of my favorite applications of Nagviz, where you've got an actual picture of your physical server room with active icons on top of it indicating the status of the various hosts. So if you actually had to troubleshoot the physical hardware or go uh, power something down or something, you'd be able to walk into this room and go, hey, look, I know this device is critical. We've got something warning down on the bottom left. And very quickly and easily find this piece of equipment and make changes to it. You can also do uh, geographic maps, for instance. So you could have a, a US or a, or a world map with uh, active icons indicating the overall status of various locations. So Nagviz is really powerful, a great visualization tool, and that's built in as well. And then business process intelligence. Um, this allows you to alert on the health of complex processes as a whole. So rather than getting an alert if a specific server were to go down, you'd be able to get an alert if uh, a certain percentage of, say, a cluster of web servers was down. So maybe only seven out of the 10 you have running need to be going at a time in order for your users to be able to use your site. Well, if, if less than seven are going, you want an alert. But if at least seven are running at a time, that's great. You don't need an alert for that. Uh, so BPI allows you to do that. It allows you to create these intelligent groupings of clusters and be alerted on those. You can also define critical members. Uh, if you look, if you see the asterisks here, that's indicating that these are critical members and that if this goes down, you want to get an alert right away because this is something that has to be running in order for the whole process to be successful. So BPI is built in as well. Uh, next up, we'll talk about Nagios XI. And 
Magios XI is an enterprise class monitoring and alerting solution that provides organizations with extended insight of their IT infrastructure before problems affect critical business processes. For more information on Nagios XI, be here right now, because I'm going to talk about it. All right. So Nagios XI, to me, uh, is a lot like Fire Mario, and uh, because he's got so many built-in capabilities. Fire Mario is really cool. He can break bricks with his head. He can shoot fireballs out of his hands. Even for a newer user, Fire Mario, you can just kind of plink your way through levels and accomplish a lot without really knowing the levels. Um, and in that way, Nagios XI is very similar. It's very powerful even for new users. Uh, it's got built-in reports, dashboards and views, configuration wizards, and the core config manager that we took a look at a little earlier. Uh, it's got auto discovery, bulk host cloning and modification, configuration rollback, and, and a lot more. And we'll go over some of those specifics starting now. So, Dashboards, uh, this is a screenshot of one dashboard, and they're super customizable inside into your infrastructure. Throughout the Nagios XI interface, you will see dashlets, and this Dashify icon means that if I click this anywhere in the XI interface, I can add this particular item to any dashboard that I'd like to. And so you can really customize these to show the information that's most important to you. There's no limit on the number of dashboards you can create, so you can make tons of different dashboards showing any kind of information you want. And in the screenshot here, this is actually a screenshot of the home page. So when you first log into Nagios XI, you're presented with the information that's most important to you. So this would be my home page dashboard in XI. And so I've got a host and service status summary, uh, current load on my local host, some disk usage comparisons. Um, another cool thing about dashboards is that you can deploy them to users. So as an administrator, you can actually create a dashboard and then deploy that to any of your users that you'd like to. Um, and also keep it synced. So if you make changes, if you'd like that to be the case, those changes carry across to all of your users and they're always seeing this specific information you want to make sure that's accessible to them. So dashboards are very, very useful. Uh, views are, are similar in that they're showing you information that's important to you, um, but views can basically be any URL, either whether from within XI or an external URL. So uh, for instance, you could actually get the permalink for one of your dashboards and put that into your views rotation the views are perfect for like a network operations center screen. You can set the rotation to happen at whatever speed you'd like. So basically you'll have these views rotating at whatever speed you want, showing you the information that's most important to you. And you can add uh, external URLs too. So you could add one of your sites that you just want to be able to see every 30 seconds and make sure everything looks good. Um, or dashboards or other pages from within XI. There are some that are built in. Um, there's the tactical overview, open problems, uh, host detail service detail, and a host group overview. And uh, as far as views, uh, it's really easy to add them. You would just click Add New View, give it a title, enter the URL. Uh, and as far as getting the permalink from within XI, that's also very easy to do. Uh, in any page in XI, if you look on the upper right, um, bottom right of this particular page, but upper right of the interface, you'd see this kind of sideways infinity symbol. Clicking that would give you the permalink, and you could then bring that back to views and add it to your rotation very quickly and easily. Uh, here's a screenshots of some of the views that are built in. So on the upper left, we've got our tactical overview. And uh, we've seen that before as we looked at the core student and pro VMs and at core. So just a great overview of the, the overall health of your environment. Uh, we've got service status and host status. And if you look at these views, you can see that uh, these were actually created using some of the, uh, the various dashlets within Nagios XI. Uh, another quick note, um, in the latest uh, release of XI, we did add this, this question mark. Um, it's basically a, a help button, and clicking this will give you access to tutorial videos and documentation relevant to the page that you're on. So as a new user, you can very quickly and easily learn about the page and what it can do and how to manage it. Uh, so that's very helpful, too. And then uh, we've got service status, host group status here. And um, as you can see, once again, these, these were actually created using dashlets from within XI. So views are a very useful way to get insight into your infrastructure very quickly. Lots of reports are built into Nagios XI as well. Um, they all have customizable date ranges, so you can determine the period of time that you want to see the data for. You can, um, it allows you to leverage the historical performance status data that XI is collecting. So it's, you know, it's collecting all of this information. It knows what happens during certain periods of time, and the reports allow you to actually look at that visually. Um, you can export the reports as uh, CSVs and PDFs. All of them can be exported as a PDF. Most of them can be uh, exported as a CSV as well. And you can email them to contacts directly from the XI interface. And you can also schedule that delivery in XI Enterprise 
so that, uh, say, every Monday morning at 8 a.m., an executive summary report would go out to a manager. So you can automate that process and not worry about it anymore. Uh, here's the executive summary. So this is one of the built-in reports. And it actually combines some of the other reports into a great summary. Uh, you've got availability, you've got top alert producers, the alert histogram, and your latest alerts. And the availability summary uh, is kind of a zoom in, so it'll be useful in showing you how everything's customized. So you can see there's some preset periods here, uh, last 24 hours, uh, last week, last month, last year. You can also do a custom date range and tell uh, Nagios XI exactly what date range you want to report on. And then you can also limit this to particular hosts, host groups, or service groups. And then on the far upper right, we could add this as one of our favorite reports. Uh, if we were to click the clock, we would actually be scheduling the report to go out on a, on a schedule. And then uh, this would be to email it directly from the interface. And we can also export it as a couple types of CSV and a PDF. Uh, so this one, the availability is basically just average host and average service availability over the time period. Um, so a really good summary for that. And then some host and service data down on the bottom. Bandwidth usage is really cool. Uh, this is new with XI 2012. Uh, anytime you're monitoring a network device, a switch or a router, uh, Nagios XI is actually going to be collecting information on the bandwidth usage of each port. And so what this report allows you to do is leverage that. And for, for instance, here we're looking at uh, .41 port 7. And we've got traffic for the last day, for the last week, the last month, and the last year as well as some additional quarterly information down on the bottom for total in and out, max, and some bandwidth utilization. Um, so we've got traffic in is green, traffic out is blue, a really useful way to visualize the bandwidth happening over a period of time. And that's built right in. It's all happening automatically. As soon as you configure monitoring of a switcher router, this data starts to be collected, and you can use this report. Uh, once a little bit is collected, you wouldn't be able to like five minutes later, but once some data has been collected, the alert histogram we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, it's basically just showing you spikes in alerts happening at particular time periods. So here we've got a pretty steady line, under 200 alerts for a whole chunk of time except for right around noon. And so it's a really quick and easy way to look at a period of time. And you could look at multiple days and say, well, you know, every day at 2 p.m. we've got a spike. We should figure out what's going on. And then correlate this with some of the other alert data coming in and figure out what the, the actual problem is. So same thing, you can customize this for the date range and export it and so on and so forth. The event log is simply that. It's a log of all of the system events happening with very detailed information on that. Uh, top alert producers uh, is, is, again, a great way to uh, see what the problem children are, see which devices are causing the most alerts to happen. Like here, over a period of 24 hours, we had 114 alerts for port 15. So I'm thinking something might be wrong with port 15. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, this is a great way to see which, uh, which of your hosts and services are causing the most problems. Uh, capacity planning uh, is part of Nagios XI 2012 Enterprise. And this allows you to use the historical data that Nagios is collecting to project future usage. Um, so this is once we've set everything up, this would be what we're looking at. And this is root partition on our local host. So this period of time is data that Nagios already has. And this period of time is data that Nagios is projecting usage for. And if you look below the graph, you can actually see that within the time range we've specified, we actually won't be at a critical or a warning value. That, that's actually out of period. So we know that for this set, of, set amount of time, likely we're not going to go beyond uh, any of our warning or critical thresholds. And it's really easy to set up. You just select a host and a service on that host. And in extrapolation options, there's actually four different options you can choose from to uh, basically the algorithm that's being run against the existing data to project the usage. And uh, this was done with Holt Winters, which apparently is the most popular. But there are uh, there's least squares and a couple other ones that I don't know much about. But um, uh, Nick Scott is here at the conference. And uh, if you have questions about those algorithms, he can probably answer them. Um, there are some visualizations built in as well. Um, there's an alert heat map, which uh, basically has time going from left to right, the past, the present. And if you look at the uh, lines, those are basically, that's a specific service having a lot of problems. And if you see a uh, strong vertical line, that's indicating that there was probably a, you know, a chunk of your network went down or something. You're having a lot of problems in that time period. Uh, the alert cloud is just a cool looking visual visualization that uh, kind of spins and shows, uh, based on color, the statuses of the various hosts that you have within uh, Nagios XI. You've got the alert stream, kind of like the heat map, where it's just showing where, where a lot of problems are happening with specific devices. And in this, you can actually click through to get more information about the problems happening with those hosts and services. 
Network replay, uh, kind of like the, the network map in Nagios Core, there's a hyper map in Nagios XI that was kind of re redesigned for XI. Same thing, it's, it's showing you a map based on the parent-child relationships that you've defined. Uh, so you've got a nice view of network topography. Only with network replay, you can replay a period of time. So you could look at the last day and see how certain hosts going down impact other hosts and just kind of watch that unfold, which is pretty cool. Um, also, uh, Andy Brist is doing uh, a whole presentation on visualizing monitoring data uh, today in track two. And uh, so if you want to learn more about the visualizations and some of the more advanced concepts, that'd be a great place to go. Uh, advanced configuration, a huge strength of Nagios XI. It makes it very easy to configure common things. Um, so with Nagios XI, you've got monitoring wizards for common devices, and I'll, I'll show you an example of one of those. You've got an auto discovery wizard that'll enable you to scan a subnet uh, using Nmap to find IPs and open ports, stuff like that, built right in. And you've also got the core config manager that we've already seen. Uh, more updated version of the CCM is built into XI as well to make uh, more the deeper changes. So as far as the uh, available wizards, you can see here it's a really comprehensive list. Um, Windows Suite, Desktop Servers, Exchange, uh, Linux, um, Agent-based and SNMP, Mac, AIX, Solaris, VMware, printers, mail servers, email delivery, a uh, whole suite of various databases, and a website, synthetic transactions using WebInject, a variety of SNMP wizards built in as well to make that a little bit easier to manage right out of the box, um, bulk host cloning and import, which we'll take a look at. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of wizards built in, and basically how they work is you go to run the monitoring wizard, and you're presented with a list of the wizards that are available. And this is just the very top of the list here. Uh, so in this case, we've selected Linux server, and we move on to step two of the wizard. So in step two on the upper left here, this is where we actually enter the IP address of our server that we want to monitor. Um, we can choose the Linux distribution that we'd like to monitor, and then click next, and we're presented with step three. Here, the wizard is actually going to tell you, hey, you need an agent. You need to install something on the machine you're going to monitor in order to successfully monitor it using this method. And it'll not only tell you, but it'll give you a link to the agent. It'll give you a link to installation instructions. And then allow you to, right out of the box, very easily monitor tons of useful metrics. And this isn't the complete list. This is just the top of it. But you can see we've got ping. We've got our yum update status, load, uh, CPU statistics, memory swap. So you can basically just select which of these you want to monitor or just leave them all selected by default. And you can also determine what their thresholds are. So default thresholds are built in, but you can fine tune this based on your organization's requirements so that you're getting alerted on exactly the, the statuses that you need to be. And then once we've completed step three, we go to step four. And here is where in the wizard, we can set up our uh, check interval. The default is every five minutes, but for some critical stuff, maybe you want to set that to a minute. So Nagios is checking every minute to make sure that this, is, uh, this device is OK, which you know, is increased load on the system, but for some stuff that might be desirable. So here you can fine tune that, or maybe it's not as important and you want to give it a 20 minute check interval. Um, you can also determine what happens when a problem is detected. Um, you can either make this so that it's automatically going to send an alert right when the problem's found, or you can have Nagios recheck it a few times to say, hey, is there really a problem before it sends you an alert? Once you've completed step four, uh, you're here at step five, and you can determine what's going to happen. Is a notification going to be sent immediately when a problem is detected? And by that, I mean after that retry interval has happened, if you've defined one. Um, and then our, our notification is going to be resent if nobody's done anything about them in a certain period of time. Uh, and then who gets the notifications? Uh, you know, your user, other individual users, uh, as well as contact groups, you can all um, you can basically have it sent to anybody you want to just with a few clicks right from here. And then moving on to step six, this is where you define host and service group associations and where you can also define parents. Um, so parent-child relationships can be defined within the wizard as well. And once you do that, you apply your configuration in the next step and it, it writes it to the Nagios core engine and boom, you're monitoring a host in just a couple of minutes with a couple of clicks without really having to understand how host and service um, configurations work within Nagios. Uh, so a lot of power very quickly running the wizards. Auto discovery is super easy to use. Um, you would just uh, define your subnet here. You can exclude IPs if you'd like to. You can either have this uh, auto discovery job run on a schedule and happen you know, every day, whatever you, however you want to do that to scan the subnet and see what's happening. Um, or you can just run it once. And then there is basic OS detection built in as well, and you can choose whether or not to use that. Once the scan completes, which can take a few minutes depending on the size of the subnet, 
you're presented with a list of all the IPs it found, all of the open ports and what's running on them. And from here, you can very quickly set up monitoring of all of these devices if you want to. Otherwise, a lot of people use auto discovery as kind of a network inventory, where you've got you know, a rolling list of the things that are being found. Bulk host cloning and import is awesome. If you've got, say, 100 Windows servers, and uh, basically with bulk host cloning and import, you'd only have to configure one the way you want it. And then with this, you could select that as your host and apply all of its settings to a list of other hosts all with a few clicks. Now one you know, word of warning is that you want to make sure the host that you're going to clone is configured right because you're about to have 50, 100, 500 of them. Uh, but with bulk host cloning and import, you can super quickly configure a bunch of like devices all with a few clicks once you've successfully configured one, which is easy because you've got a wizard to do it in most cases. So that's very powerful as well. Uh, and then there's configuration rollback, which is kind of like a one-up. Um, it's basically like an extra life. Um, because what you can do is if you configure something and something goes wrong and you're applying that change to the core engine and it comes back with an error and says, hey, no, I can't apply this configuration, there's a problem. In this case, you can automatically just roll back. Uh, well, the way it would work is that Nagios would continue to monitor with the last good configuration, but you wouldn't be able to successfully apply new changes and configurations until you'd done something to correct the problem. In this case, you could just go back to the previous good configuration before you had uh, done whatever configurations resulted in the error, roll back to that and then start over. It's basically like getting to retry the level and it also allows you to output a log of, what, of the attempt to apply the configuration which is really helpful for troubleshooting the problems that might have happened. Um, so configuration rollback is very useful too and you can export a text file to config snapshots. And there is a lot more built in too. Uh, XI's got an integrated database. It's got a backend API that can produce XML data uh, it's got really easy multi-tenancy. I didn't get into user management much, but it's super easy to determine what users can see, what they can do, who's getting alerts. All of this is super easy within XI. Um, Nagviz, which we saw earlier, BPI, which we saw earlier, are also built in. It's got Google Maps integration, where you can use geo coordinates to create active maps of things that are going on. Um, it's got Nagios Mobile, and we're, we're just scratching the surface. Um, it's not that, uh, you know, XI is considerably easier to use for someone who doesn't know Nagios well, but for somebody who does, you can leverage that knowledge. And there's a lot of depth within XI that, uh, you know, I've just brushed the surface of. Um, here's, here's a couple of useful places to learn more. We've got Nagios.org, which would be a great place to learn about Core. Uh, Nagios.com, which is a great place to learn about uh, XI and Fusion and the other various Nagios Enterprises offerings. There's the Exchange Community site. And then support.nagios.com forward slash forum is a place to get uh, free help for anybody, whether you're using Core or XI, basically anything. Um, there's a really strong community supporting there as well as the Nagios support team. So Nagios Text will actually help you out for free on the forum. Just go there, register a username, and uh, they'll help you out. Feel free to post about pretty much any, <clears throat> excuse me, anything you need help with. Well, I don't know what that is. <laughs> That's not the next slide. Hey, there we go. Uh, well, anyway, the next slide, there wasn't a lot to it. Uh, it was basically, it said questions at the top, if you can visualize that. And uh, it also mentioned a couple of presentations that Sam Lansing is going to do here, uh, one at 2 o'clock today, and I think one around 2 o'clock tomorrow, where he's going to talk about uh, some of the other Nagios products that are available beyond just XI, like uh, Fusion, which gives you a uh, tactical visual overview of multiple Nagios instances. Um, Network Analyzer, which Ethan mentioned in the keynote, and a couple other things. So this is, you know, if you want to learn more about what's available beyond the stuff I've talked about, uh, it's all happening here at, I think, 2 o'clock today and tomorrow. Um, but with all that being said, I uh, really want to thank everybody for coming. It was great uh, spending a few minutes with you guys and showing you some of the Nagios stuff that's going on. I uh, wanted to ask if anybody has any questions at this point. So here's the chance, everybody, where you get to participate just a little bit. If somebody's got a question, just raise your hand. I'll run over with the microphone. I was saying, is he that thorough that he got through everything? Seamus, you're that. amazing. <laughs> you're talking about the Nagios Mobile? Yeah. Does that talk to the Fusion as well? Uh, not so much that I'm aware of. Um, 
So Fusion, basically, let's say you've got 10 Nagio servers. Fusion is giving you kind of a one-stop shop to see what's happening in all of them mm -hmm. and very quickly click through um, to the individual servers to manage them and configure them. But really, it's just a good place to see everything at once. I'm not sure that there's a mobile version of that, but that's a really cool idea, actually, to be able to see what's happening in Fusion from a mobile interface. So um, we're, we're definitely going to, going to Fusion. Okay. And then when you talk about having mobile and having yeah. it in your pocket. Yeah. That would be really powerful. Let's yeah. put everything I'll in my pocket. I'll make a note of that. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, but at this point, I uh, don't think we do, no. Okay. Thanks for the question. Just to the side, we have it running in my company, and I can guarantee you that at least the now install, it only handles one install of Nagas. Okay. Looks like we've got one back here, Mike. Well, I'm new to Nagios, but so far the reporting and stuff has not been everything that I wanted it to be. And is there any chance that in a future release there's going to be ad hoc reporting where I can customize my reports further? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I'd have to check with the dev team. Uh, I'm not certain. I know that primarily we steer Nagios XI development based on feedback we get from our clients. Um, so if, you know, if something's popular, if there's a requirement from a lot of our clients for a particular type of report or a way to do an ad hoc report like you've asked for, it'll definitely come up sooner or later. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe after the presentation you could give me more details. I think we talked a little last night. Um, so I can find out exactly what you're looking for and make sure that they know about it. So yeah, I couldn't guarantee that that'll be the case, but typically if a lot of people would find it useful, it'll end up there sooner or later. Anything else? You guys look hungry. Oh, well, here we go. <laughs> yeah, it's almost lunchtime, yeah. <laughs> All right, so for, for auto discovery, yeah. um, is there any possibility of customizing the discovery rules? So I, I notice you're doing something looks like an in-map scan or something and looking for open yeah. ports, but is, it, uh, is, is there a way to do some additional customization, maybe run a PowerShell script on a Windows box, for example, to see what services are running or that ah. kind of stuff? Uh, not so much. It's a pretty basic scan. It's bringing back IPs and open ports, telling you what's running on those. But beyond excluding certain IPs and doing basic OS detection, there's really not a lot of other ways to, to do anything active beyond just scanning it and bringing back a list. Now, within the wizards and, you know, event handlers, for instance, can be configured so that if something happens, you could do that. You could run a PowerShell script against the device. But that's not really something I, I don't believe. I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty certain that that wouldn't be built into auto-discovery. Is that, is that something that, um, <clears throat> that we could customize ourselves, though, write, write our own scripts and so on? Um, I'm, I guess depending on your requirements, we could take a look at it. It might be something that we could help you custom develop, or be, you know, depending on your skills and abilities, maybe something you could do. Because auto discovery is just a wizard, and that's one of the cool things about Nagios XI. It's super extendable and customizable. You can actually customize your own uh, dashlets, components, wizards, stuff like that. So really, you could just look at the existing wizard, and if you had the expertise, you could modify it so that it would do what you want to. Um, now, as far as how feasible that is, I really don't know. I wouldn't have enough knowledge, but I can find out for you. Okay. All right, thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. I know that, um, that XI incorporates everything in, and it's basically an easy configuration for users. But are all the features that are built into XI are also available in core, just with no support? That's a great question. Uh, actually, no. Um, you know, you, with core, like, you know, you can monitor anything with core, absolutely. And you can extend the interface and reporting and stuff like that. But things like the dashboards, um, views, the monitoring wizards, the, the auto discovery and bulk host cloning and stuff like that is XI specific. So it wouldn't be something that you could uh, find an add-on, for instance, and extend core to do. Uh, so there is some stuff built in that's really specifically XI, but general capabilities with any of them, you can monitor pretty much anything. OK, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, with the XI 2014, I believe there is the end push. Uh, um, I'm going to have some sneak peek previews of how that, is that going to work with the auto discovery, because I'm thinking about replacing SCSM with an agency, you know, XI. Uh, 
I, I actually wasn't able to hear the question. I'm sorry. Could you? Could, I, I think it might have been on. Uh, with the XI 2014, uh, there's an push technology embedded in it. Will there be a sneak peek of for us to actually look at it and how is that going to possibly replace my SCSM <coughs> managing the hardware and pushing the... Uh, you mean at the conference here? Yeah. Uh, that I'm not certain on. Um, I, maybe this gentleman could help. Thanks, Ethan. Um, I, I, I think you might be able to see some of the end push stuff. I think uh, Yancey Rebens is giving a talk on window, Windows monitoring either today or Thursday, I believe. You might be able to see that. But in regards to how it hooks in with auto discovery, um, those pieces are not there yet. That gets back to uh, what I mentioned in the keynote about um, kind of the configuration pool where when things are automatically discovered, it can start monitoring. Uh, it's an interesting idea to automatically push things out an agent. You have to do that with caution, though, uh, before you deploy too much automation on your network. But yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? This is good. You guys are coming up I with some good questions. questions. I like this. This is a little banter going back and forth here. Do we have anybody else? Seamus Demaray. It was his first presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Nice job. Thanks a lot for joining me, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference.